Okay, let's start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Data Architectures for Data Science Using Data Visualization. My name is Sue Reber, and I'll be your moderator today. I work on the marketing team here at Data Virtuality, and I'm excited to be hosting this session today. I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers, Rick van der Lens, a highly respected independent analyst, consultant, author, and internationally acclaimed lecturer. He is specialized in data warehousing, business intelligence, data, big data, database technology, and data visualization. And we, I have with me Dr. Nick Golovin, the founder and CEO of Data Virtuality. Before I hand the mic over to Rick and Nick, I would like to um, cover a few housekeeping items. Um, first, today's webinar will be recorded, and we will send you the link to the recorded session once it's available. Please feel free to share the link also with your colleagues and your network. Next, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. So if you have any question for our speakers, please feel free to send it through the chat at any time. I will collect all questions and they will then be answered at the end of the session. Please don't use the speak button as it is disabled. If we don't get to your question during today's webinar, we'll of course make sure that we follow up afterwards. And last, we have built in three poll questions, which will help us to tailor the content of this webinar to your needs. And without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off with small intros of the presenters, presenters themselves. Rick, over to you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, good day, everyone. First of all, thank you, Sue and Nick, for inviting me to present at this webinar. And thanks to all the listeners for logging in. Okay, let me introduce myself briefly. As Sue said, I'm an independent analyst uh, for over 30 years. I've specialized in database technology, uh, data warehousing, business intelligence, and related topics. Uh, what I do with the topics is I, I write about them. I write books, I write uh, articles, I write white papers. Uh, next to that, I talk about the topics at events, uh, doing keynotes and seminars, uh, and I still do consultancy work. And there I try to help out companies coming up, for example, with new data the architectures and the last 10 years uh, one of the topics I have focused uh, quite heavily on is data virtualization uh, I even wrote two books on that topic uh, and I would say well that's that's me in a nutshell Nick thank you Rick uh, hi everybody I'm Nick uh, I'm founder of data virtuality uh, I have uh, both industry background in doing uh, large scales uh, scale data integration projects and also have a scientific background uh, in data integration and machine learning. And uh, I started Data Virtuality together with my colleagues uh, in 2012 to help companies make their data more accessible for different business use cases, including data science use cases. Well, thank you for your interest, Rick and Nick. And here we'd like to run the first poll question, which will help us to better understand our audience. Um, you have 30, question, uh, 30 seconds time to um, answer. And our first question would be, what is your current position? Uh, you'll be able to see the answers while you um, answer. So um, it seems that most of our listeners are data architects, then uh, consultants, and we have some from management and some others. Um, I hope this helps you, Rick and Nick, to tailor the, the content. And I'll hand over to Nick. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, so talking about, um, about data science, uh, 
from my perspective, data science actually has a quite a long history with a lot of changes and challenges along the way. Uh, so we had new use cases, uh, new algorithms, uh, new tools, and of course, more and more data is uh, becoming available. Uh, so Rick, how do you think uh, these changes and those challenges have influenced data science? And uh, what do you see as the current big challenges that data scientists face? And what do you think are specifically the challenges from a data architecture standpoint, especially having in mind that we have quite a lot of uh, data architects today? Right, right. Um, well, first of all, I, I fully agree with you, Nick, that data scientists have always had to face many changes, many challenges, organizational ones, technical ones, you name it. But, but let me focus on the three key challenges that they're facing today, as you've just asked. Uh, um, the first one, I, I would say, is that they have to deal with the new regulations for data privacy, right, such so as GDPR. And let me explain that a little bit. Uh, to simplify data access for data scientists, concepts such as data lakes and data hubs and data sandboxes have been introduced, right, the last couple of years. So uh, what all three have in common is that data from several source systems is really copied yeah, to a centralized data storage environment. Now, this, this centralization of data storage, storage clashes somewhat with these new regulations for data privacy and protection. Yeah, for example, they define a limit what organizations are allowed to do with their data, which types of data they are allowed to store, how long the data can be kept, yeah, and for which purposes it may be used. Now, one of the effects of GDPR is that data that identifies people can't be used in its original form and that certain combinations of data elements are not allowed to be stored together. In a way, it, it clashes yeah, with the concepts of data lakes and data hubs in which data storage is really centralized. Uh, now, some of these issues can be bypassed by uh, uh, supremizing data through masking, scrambling, filtering, aggregating, or compressing data. And of course, it's the responsibility of the data architects to make sure that data scientists have access to all the data required and that some of the data is masked and scrambled. But, but nevertheless, yeah, it's, it's, it's a yeah, challenge number one yeah, for data scientists. Uh, the second yeah, the second challenge I want to mention here yeah, is the fast changing data storage landscape. Yeah, before the big data era, yeah, most enterprise data was stored on-prem, right, using SQL databases. Yeah, new data storage technologies were hardly ever adopted. Big data changed all that. Yeah, organizations moved data to cloud platforms using new data storage technologies, yeah, such as Hadoop or Amazon S3 and Microsoft Azure Data Lake. And all, of course, all of them are supporting or are supporting uh, massively parallel processing uh, now, this change of data storage landscape complicates the work of data scientists. And lately, with the arrival of new analytical SQL databases, such as Amazon Athena, Google BigQuery, and Snowflake, and some others, yeah, more data storage platforms were deployed, which again changed the data storage landscape. And again, yeah, data scientists had to work with different data storage technologies. Now, in this diagram yeah, that you see in front of you, I tried to bring some structure to this complex market by classifying them. But as you can also see, yeah, the market of data storage technologies has become a big and very diverse market and has changed enormously yeah, the last so many years. But the point is, every time yeah, when a da new data storage technology is adopted yeah, by the organization, yeah, it means hard work for the data scientists to learn how to work with it efficiently. Okay, let's make a sidestep here before I go on. Yeah, um, I do want to say that this is not a plea for rejecting new data storage technologies, right? Most of them offer real benefits, such as increased performance, up and down scalability, more autonomous processing, and uh, enriched analytical capabilities. Really great stuff, right? Uh, but it makes it hard for the data scientist. Okay, the third challenge is, is definitely not the least important one and is related to the data preparation tasks of data science. Let me spend some time on this challenge uh, to explain it really well. Now, as, as, as you all know, uh, developing data science models is not just a simple matter of switching on an analytical tool, pointing it to a data set, and before you know it, several descriptive or prescriptive models pop up. Would be great. It's not how it works. Uh, developing data science models is a complex multi-step process, as I'm trying to show with this diagram. 
These nine steps can be divided into two groups, right? The first group is responsible uh, for retrieving the data required for the data science exercise and transforming it into a form required for analytics. Uh, well, the second group of steps deals with the actual analytical work. Uh, and evidently, this whole process is highly, highly interactive or iterative. Uh, now, together, the first group of steps is commonly referred to as the data preparation phase. And you've probably seen these studies that say that data scientists spend no less than 80% of their valuable time on data preparation, of which a considerable amount of time is devoted to that second step, the data selection step. During this data selection step, data scientists determine which data elements they need, you know, identify from which systems it needs to be extracted, you know, develop programs to extract the data from those systems, transform the data into meaningful data, load all the extracted data in some system, and then finally make the data easily available for analytics. Now, although this may sound easy and straightforward, you know, data selection can be a time-consuming exercise. And one reason is that data scientists are, are dependent on the availability of other developers you know, to help them extract that data. Oh, and by the way, in real-life projects, these steps are executed in parallel, you know, concurrently, and in a very interactive way. It's, it's definitely not a serial process. Now, this time-consuming data preparation phase reduces the time the data scientists can allocate to analyze data and develop these predictive and descriptive models. So we need solutions that shorten the time they need to spend on the data preparation phase. And I would say that roughly three groups of solutions exist. The first group yeah, is deploying data preparation tools. Yeah, lots of data preparation tools have become available that simplify and or automate some of the data preparation tasks. So that helps, right? Uh, the, uh, the, the second one is offloading work to data engineers, right? That's the second solution. You know, many data preparation tasks are highly technical and may require in-depth knowledge of the source systems and the data. Yeah. Now, to save time on the side of the data scientists, it's sort of recommended to leave most of the data preparation work to so-called data engineers. They have the right qualifications for the technical part of data preparation. But in this webinar, we focus on the third one, right? Extending and adapting the data architecture in such a way that data selection becomes more simpler yeah, and more flexible. So, Rick, are you talking about um, us needing a completely new data architecture, uh, the one which is more suited for supporting data scientists? Um, I'm not sure we all need a new data architecture, so, but organizations definitely need to adapt the current data architecture or, or indeed develop a, a new one that somehow addresses uh, the following 10 challenges. Uh, let me show you uh, the 10 challenges for data scientists. So in fact, uh, the challenges for architectures yeah, that help data scientists to sort of minimize the amount of time they spend on uh, data, the data preparation phase. Okay, so now I need a few minutes to go through this list, but this is key to our uh, webinar right now. So, challenge number one, yeah, data is everywhere. Yeah, as you probably know, the data needed by data scientists is not often stored in just one specific source system, right? But it's spread across a multitude of systems. It's stored in financial systems, sales systems, data warehouse, website logs, and so on. Additionally, you know, data scientists want to analyze data coming from external sources, such as uh, public data marketplaces. Uh, now, because organizations can have thousands of applications and databases, determining you know, which systems contain the required data can be an exhausting exercise uh, by itself. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. No, it's more like looking for a needle in a whole group of uh, haystacks. Challenge number two you know, deals with the fact that data is stored in a heterogeneous set of data sources. I think that it's highly unlikely that the systems you know, containing the required data are all developed with the same technology. I would say it's more likely that different storage technologies are used, right? Ranging from simple flat files via SQL databases to Hadoop and NoSQL. And some data may be stored in spreadsheets, right? Word documents, legacy systems, uh, who did you agree? Um, uh, all these technologies support different interfaces, languages, and database concepts, uh, which means that data scientists need to use many different languages for extracting relevant data. A new data architecture should, should help the data scientists somehow with this. Uh, 
Number three is a technical one. Yeah? Data is stored in a schema on read form. I think with the introduction of Hadoop and cloud platforms, it has become quite common to store data in systems that do not understand the structure of the data. Call it schema on read. Right? For example, if, if a customer if customer address data is stored in the schema on read way, applications are not able to ask for the names of the customers from the northern region. Huh? Just an example. This, the point is the structure of the data is not known to the storage system. Instead, applications themselves need to know how to interpret that data. In other words, the schema, or call it the structure, you know, of this structure-less data is determined by the applications when they read the data. That's why we call it schema on read. When schema on read is used, data scientists, unfortunately, need to spend a lot of time on transforming structureless data into structure-rich data, else it's just difficult to process for the tools they use. Offering structure-rich data to data scientists saves them a lot of time. By the way, from a data storage perspective, storing structure-less data offers some benefits, of course. You know, the most important one being data storage flexibility, which means uh, if the structure of the original data changes, the definition of the data structure doesn't need to be changed. Uh, the data already loaded, which has the old data structure, can remain unchanged. The next one is data is hidden behind applications. That's the next one, right? Uh, a large portion of enterprise data is stored in databases that are part of packaged applications. In this case, not the organization, but the vendor of the application designed the data structure. Although it is technically possible, vendors often discourage direct access to these databases. Instead, it's recommended to access the data through a supplied interface. And these are proprietary and unique interfaces that need to be studied by the data scientists, right? Uh, which makes, which costs time. Challenge five, right? And I think we're all familiar with this one. Uh, data coming from source systems may be stored in a very cryptic way. Uh, data extracted from these source systems can be so cryptic, uh, uh, which really complicates the work of the data scientists. Well, well, I don't think I have to explain this to you. I think we're all familiar with this. Uh, challenge number six, right? The data history is completely missing. Not all transactional source systems keep track of history, right? In such systems where when, when data changes, the old version is just overwritten with the new version. Older versions of the data may be useful for data scientists, uh, however, especially if they want to analyze the data historically. Building a solution you know, to start keeping track of the history is quite an engineering task. You, you don't want data scientists you know, to work on that type of, uh, of engineering. Change, challenge number seven, right? Data quality is poor. Mind you, for all the listeners, this is for you completely an hypothetical issue, but for some companies it's, uh, it's an issue, right? Data quality is poor. Uh, now, because it's poor, yeah, data may require cleansing before it can be analyzed, because incorrect data can lead to incorrect data science models. Now, some incorrect data values are easy to spot for everyone. Right. For example, for identifying a misspelled city name and recognizing an impossibly high employee age, yeah, common sense is, is, is sufficient. But some incorrect data is not so easy to identify and may require in-depth knowledge of the business and the source system before it can be corrected. It's the responsibility, I would say, of data owners to make sure that the data stored in the systems is correct. But if it's not, you know, data scientists need to spend time on correcting the data and upgrading it to a quality level that results in reliable models. I would say a new data architecture should help out with this uh, somehow, right? Metadata is missing. Some data sources are poorly documented. Even if data is stored in a structure-rich style, its meaning may still be unclear. For example, if a column in a SQL database is called revenue, it still leaves many questions unanswered. Unanswered, right? Is it is it gross or net revenue? Is is it total revenues per store, per city, region, province? Uh, so descriptive metadata is indispensable for data scientists. Incorrect interpretation of data uh, leads to incorrect data science models and eventually to poor business decisions. So again, if we build a new data architecture or adapt an existing one, it has to give the data scientists access to that metadata. 
data security rules are restrictive, right? Data security rules may be in place that do not allow data scientists to access the data. Or maybe they only have partial access to the data. They may have access to data, but that data may not be allowed to be copied and stored outside its original security realm. Uh, a new data architect has to come up with a solution for this, right? Um, all right, and the last challenge relates to data privacy, and as I already said a few minutes ago, yeah, not all the data that an organization stores can be used by data scientists without modifications. Yeah, regulations may require sensitive data, such as personally identifiable data, to be uh, pseudonymized, uh, or filtered, or masked, or scrambled, or aggregated, before it's made available to them. Uh, um, uh, so careful, yeah. When, when data uh, uh, pseudonymized, yeah, certain data elements may become useless, right, for data scientists. Uh, so just just to sort of summarize, yeah, life is tough for data scientists with respect to accessing data stored in source systems. And and as I said, if we design a new data architecture that needs to support data science, this data architecture somehow needs to deal with these ten challenges I just discussed to make life easier for them. Uh, Rick, so um, thank you very much for um, uh, for describing those challenges to us. Uh, but you know, while I was I was I was listening to you, I thought, okay, so some of those challenges are maybe maybe grew um, stronger in the past time, but uh, many challenges are actually not new. So I, I would assume that companies are already doing things uh, to solve this problem. So like let's say data lakes, uh, cloud platforms. Uh, what is your take on it? Well, I think you're you're, you're spot on. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so so let, let me discuss two popular solutions that I've been I've seen being deployed in in, in lots of organizations the last couple of years. Uh, so let's let's begin with the, with the cloud. Yeah, an architectural solution uh, to, to help data scientists with their data needs and to solve some of their challenges I just mentioned yeah, is based on copying all the required data from the source systems to a cloud platform such as Amazon, Google or Microsoft. Uh, and such a solution offers some really, really good benefits. Uh, first of all, yeah, most of the cloud platforms offer fast data access, even on big data, right? Uh, which definitely speeds up the data scientist queries. Uh, Another benefit is that storage is relatively cheap, right? Um, and these concepts of schema on read and schema on write, yeah, those formats are both supported, so that's a benefit. And data scientists need to access only one centralized environment to retrieve data instead of many. Uh, another benefit is that data scientists can add their own data to these environments. For example, uh, data coming from specific tests that they've done and uh, analytical exercises. Uh, so that sort of solves the problem of collecting the data. So this is all good, right? Uh, but unfortunately, not all the 10 challenges yeah, that I just mentioned are overcome by moving data to cloud platforms. Yeah, if you look closely at such a solution, yeah, six of the 10 challenges still remain. Uh, so challenge number three, yeah, data stored in a schema or read form, that, that data still needs to be turned into structure rich data. Challenge number five, data is still cryptic, yeah, which means it still needs to be transformed into meaningful data. And just copying it into a cloud platform doesn't automatically transform it. Uh, data history is, is still missing. Uh, data quality is still poor because by copying it to a data lake, you don't address this problem. Uh, the metadata is missing. Uh, data security and data privacy rules are still can still be restrictive. Uh, Okay, so, so in short, uh, simply centralizing all the data on a cloud platform offers data scientists some important benefits, but it's, it's not a complete solution. And, and Nick, the, the second architectural and popular solution you know, to speed up the data selection task is, is the data lake, right? Very popular. The data lake was originally introduced to support data science and similar forms of exploratory and investigative forms of analytics. In a way, yeah, the data lake is somewhat similar to the cloud platform solution, yeah, which is not so strange because many data lakes are implemented using file systems on cloud platforms. The difference with the previous solution is that a data lake is a more managed environment than just a file system. However, with respect to the 10 challenges, it only tackles three of them, right? Uh, uh, challenge number one, data is everywhere. Well, 
not with the data lake, not anymore. It's now all in one system. The challenge number two, data is stored in a heterogeneous set of source systems. Well, not anymore, right? It's now developed with one specific technology. And challenge number four, data is hidden behind applications. Again, not anymore. It's stored as all the other data. However, uh, with it, and I really have to add this, uh, yeah, with a data lake, yeah, what a data lake really is has changed somewhat over the years. Yeah, for some, it's an environment that consists of zones, or and some call them layers or tiers. Uh, and if they do that, in a, a data lake is divided into zones, right? Uh, data is first copied to the landing zone, which can be seen as the original data lake. Next, the data is slightly processed and copied to the curated zone, and subsequently it's processed and copied to the production zone. So step by step, the data becomes more meaningful for and needs less and less transformational work by data scientists. Adding zones to data lakes solves two more challenges, right? Data is stored in a schema on, on read form. That was a challenge number three. Well, by copying it to the next zone, we can assign structure to the data. And through that, it becomes structure-rich data. Challenge number five, data scriptive. Yeah, cryptic can be solved. Again, by copying it to the zone, uh, we can descramble the cryptic data to more meaningful values. Uh, all right, I, I hope that that made sense, but it means still five challenges yeah, are still there. So to come back to your question, Nick, yes, organizations have already tried different things to solve these problems. But there's a third solution yeah, based on data virtualization, which is becoming increasingly popular. But before we discuss that one, question to you, Nick. Uh, so, 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 well, since you have a great market inside yourself and have the technical understanding of all this, uh, what is your take on, on cloud or the data lake? Uh, why do you think that all the challenges are still very prominent? Yeah. So I, I I would I would agree uh, on on all these topics uh, on all these uh, these items with you, Rick. Um, I would maybe amend um, with some with something we um, we noted in our in our market interactions, and uh, I'm talking about those first two challenges, which basically uh, boil down to the problem of siloed data. So data is everywhere, and data is stored in a heterogeneous way. So basically, different silos out there, and here we actually see an interesting interesting uh, change in the mindset about how people think about those two things uh, data lake and cloud cloud platform I think the idea of data lake was was there like first so it's 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 around there for many years already and when it started there was really a lot of a lot of expectation that data lake will solve um, those first two challenges basically get get, get rid of siloed data. Uh, but it seems that now where where the concept of cloud platforms uh, and cloud data lakes, cloud data warehouses is, is getting more popular and more prominent, it seems that this idea of having all data physically in one place is not actually having that much popularity compared to the like original Hadoop, Hadoop type of data lake. Because uh, and we see it basically for two reasons. Um, so for, for one reason, uh, one reason is that people are reluctant to put all their data into one cloud provider. So that's where we see people talking about uh, multi-cloud architectures or uh, hybrid architectures, for example. And another another topic is actually data security and data privacy, uh, which also makes people kind of reluctant putting all the data into into uh, into a single uh, single cloud cloud database uh, and again we have people talking about hybrid architectures there and we people we have people realize that actually especially due to the latest uh, legal regulations it's actually not allowed to have all those data physically in one place, be it in cloud or in data lake or anywhere. So, like, if you really want to have it all, uh, no, you have to, you have to, you have to cope with some restrictions on doing this. So, this is something we see, we see, we see on the market. So, while originally people thought, okay, silo data will be gone soon uh, with the with the, uh, with the, with the rise of Hadoop-based data lakes, so now with cloud platforms, we see 
uh, we see the expectations being more moderate about about uh, about bridging those silos. So people kind of have a more more understanding that the silos will will stay. Uh, some silos may be removed uh, by by cloud platforms, but actually one more one more silo is coming uh, in in on top in a way. So that's kind of that's what, what kind of we see and we see on the on, on the market right now this kind of thinking. But um, I mean, we, we have talked about the challenges, uh, and um, you also just mentioned uh, data virtualization. We have it in the title. So before uh, before we go on uh, and talk more about this, I would like to start uh, another poll. Again, it's thirty seconds, and this poll is about uh, how. Uh, how much our audience today, uh, what is the experience level with respect to data virtualization? So the poll is running, it's 30 seconds. Yeah, so I think I think the poll is over, and it's a it's a pleasure to see a, um, a good amount of people, about one third of people who, who have already experienced with data virtualization. Uh, but as far as I can see, actually two thirds of our audience today uh, just heard about data virtualization or have no prior knowledge of data virtualization. So maybe uh, Rick, uh, for those who are not not too familiar with data virtualization, can can you give a, a short intro of some minutes to the topic? I can uh, sure do that. Uh, I think I've done it before. Um, okay, so let's move to the next slide here. Um, all right, just just to start, uh, data virtualization uh, operates as a data abstraction layer between source systems and data consumers, as I'm showing in this diagram. It uh, it can access almost any kind of source system uh, using almost any kind of technical interface, and data virtualization can make that data available to all types of data consumers, uh, including simple dashboards, multiple mobile apps, spreadsheet users, websites, and, and of course, data scientists. And data consumers extract data from the source systems via the data virtualization server, right? And then the data virtualization server integrates and transforms and filters and aggregates the data. In other words, all the data processing specifications, which are commonly spread across an entire data warehouse environment, are now defined centrally within the data virtualization server. And then, of course, metadata is there to describe and define the data that resides within this server as well. And this data abstraction layer can also serve for data scientists as a central uh, access layer to govern data that can be easily queried and modeled. And this makes the whole data preparation process easier for all parties involved. Now, now where most you know, traditional technologies for data integration, such as ETL, require data to be stored after the data processing specifications have been processed, data virtualization is optimized to execute these specifications on demand. Yeah, in general, yeah, this offers more agility for 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 data delivery. Rick, Rick, yeah. can I ask a question before you continue? Yeah. Uh, so, what you described so far, it sounds uh, sounds quite uh, quite like the description of data federation technology. So, what is uh, what is actually data federation versus data virtualization? Maybe maybe you can. You can highlight um, highlight uh, if there is any difference at some at some point in your presentation. Yeah, well, in, in short, I think together we can talk for hours on this particular topic. Uh, but in short, data federation is is one 
of the more important features of a data virtualization product. So a data federation feature, uh, if a product supports that, then you can sort of combine data yeah, coming from all kinds of data sources. And it will, data federation also means that the data consumer sees all those data sources as one logical database. Uh, uh, very important feature yeah, of data virtualization, but today we need a lot more features. So, so we need features to manage metadata to give us impact, uh, what is it, lineage and uh, uh, impact analysis capabilities. We want to have logging. I mean, the list is much, much longer. Uh, so federation is just one uh, feature of data virtualization. But I think if, if, if your product, Nick, would only support data federation, I don't think you would sell a lot. Uh, uh, there's a lot more to that. But I hope that is sort of enough for now. Is that okay, Nick? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, if I sort of continue with data virtualization, yeah, if we look on the inside, yeah, the core building block of a data virtualization server is, is the view. And some call it the virtual table. The definition of a view specifies which data processing operations must be applied to source data when it's retrieved by data consumers. Yeah, so as, as I already said, yeah, examples of data processing operations are aggregations and filters and joins and calculations and concatenations and masking stuff. Uh, and, and through these views, source data can be transformed into whatever business users and data scientists need. And the language used to specify the data processing uh, specs is the popular SQL language. In fact, most views are defined using SQL. Now, when data is accessed through views, all the operations are applied to the data, right? So, for example, when a view with a definition containing a filter and an aggregation operation is accessed, both operations are applied to the data before it's returned to the data consumers. In other words, the operations making up the definition of a view are applied on demand. Yeah, it's not stored. Uh, also important to know is that views can be stacked on top of each other, as I'm showing in this diagram. In this diagram, three layers of views are defined. Mind you, this is not mandatory, it's, it's optional, but it's best practice. Uh, so here, each layer of views has certain tasks, right? The bottom layer of the views is commonly responsible for extracting data from the source systems. The middle layer takes care of data integration and, if required, data cleansing. Uh, and then in the top layer, yeah, the views have a data structure that meets the requirements of the data consumers. And together, the three layers transform the data coming from the source system to the form required by the data scientists. Uh, also, yeah, most data virtualization servers offer an extensive, a very flexible mechanism for materialization of views. And when a view is materialized, the virtual contents of that view is determined. Yeah, so the data is pulled from the underlying systems and it's stored in a database. And from then on, when the materialized view is queries, queried, the stored contents is accessed. So the cached contents is accessed instead of the underlying uh, systems. And in addition, no transformation are required anymore in that case because the operations have already been applied. Now, with data virtualization, data security and data privacy rules can be centrally defined for all the data. And it, it's very important that data accessible via a data virtualization is protected, right, against any form of deliberate or accidental unauthorized uh, use. Therefore, the data virtualization servers offer a rich set of authentication, authorization, and encryption features to protect the data in the data sources. Uh, what we could also do is uh, rules related to data privacy, such as the uh, as, uh, uh, pseudonymization uh, rules uh, can be defined in the views as well. Uh, so again, uh, data can be scrambled, masked, or aggregated if needed. Um, um, and let me let me sort of finish this short intro by saying something about performance, right? Because a lot of people have questions about performance. Uh, uh, data virtualization servers are designed specifically to access source systems, right? It's important that they access these source systems as efficiently as possible. Therefore, they offer several advanced internal techniques for executing queries on such systems. And one of the key features is what is what is called query pushdown. Yeah, with query pushdown, yeah, as many data processing operations as possible that are making up a query are pushed down by the data virtualization server yeah, to the source systems. Now, this allows the data virtualization server to maximize the speed yeah, of these source systems. For example, 
you know, if the source system is a Snowflake database server, the data virtualization server will let Snowflake do most of the query processing to fully use its parallel query processing power. On the other hand, if the source system is a simple file system, almost no processing operations can be pushed down and the data virtualization server will do most of the processing uh, uh, itself, right? Uh, so the data virtualization server determines dynamically how much query processing is pushed down. All right, I hope that's sort of sufficient background information for those not that familiar with data virtualization uh, yet. Uh, now, Nick, I've talked about data virtualization service in a somewhat general form. Is there something unique that the data virtuality product brings to the table? Yeah, thank you for the question, Rick. We'll be happy to uh, we'll be happy to answer to answer this. So I will not describe uh, describe things in the detail because uh, you, Rick, just just did it very well. Um, I would just basically highlight um, highlight some additional, some unique things which data virtuality brings to the table. And this also, uh, those things kind of have a practitioner's, practitioner's uh, touch to it. So looking at the logical data warehouse architecture with data virtuality, so you have on the left side, you have all kinds of data sources. On the right side, you have uh, data consumption. And here you can have both people who just consume the data, but you also have a kind of metadata portal and metadata, uh, we call it like a data shop where you can uh, search and look for metadata and consume the data at the same time. So you would find all those things uh, here, which you uh, which you mentioned, Rick, so like data federation, permissions management, audit, uh, uh, and so on, push down, push down of things. Um, uh, the two two very important things which uh, which I as a practitioner stumbled upon, uh, which led me to uh, to uh, to creating data virtuality as a product, are the following things. So one thing which I was always missing with my projects uh, with uh, classical data virtualization tools or data federation tools was the lack of the historical perspective. Um, so basically, that means that with direct access to the data sources, but also with caching, you just only have whatever things, uh, whatever things are there in the, in the data sources. So either one-on-one -on -one or maybe with some time, time delay, but it more or less reflects what, what's, what's there. So it does not really touch on the, on the, uh, on the historical perspective. And this is something I was missing. I was missing a lot in my projects. And this is why data virtuality has, uh, in addition to data virtualization component, it also has a storage and it has a ETL ELT component in it. And this ETL ELT component has uh, special features which allow you to uh, to get this historical data. So you could, for example, uh, build a slowly changing dimension uh, with a wizard in the storage, or you could run an um, import for form of text file or JSON file from some FTP server and store it in the in the analytical storage. So basically, uh, this aspect of having not only the snapshots from the from the sources, but actually also the the things where you can store historical data and also the things where you can um, kind of cleanse, uh, cleanse and transform the data. So this was important, uh, important to have in my understanding in my project. So this is why we have a combined combined architecture here. And the other thing and I was missing, which also kind of relate, relate relates to what you uh, what you showed, Rick, uh, like heavily um, heavily being based on views. Uh, so the power of views, so the views can be very powerful, but being a declarative thing, uh, they only have that much power when it comes to doing complex transformations. And um, I was missing uh, missing this power in uh, in in my previous projects. So this is why uh, data virtuality. Uh, also has the possibilities of doing procedural SQL uh, and also of doing of using scripting languages inside the system in order to also do very complex uh, and powerful data transformation. And this plays nicely together with this uh, analytical uh, storage which we have in the system because this is where you can store the intermediate uh, results of the transformations. So these are these are the things which I was kind of missing when I was implementing real life use cases with traditional data data virtualization tools. 
these these were the things I was missing from the practitioner practitioner's perspective, and this is something which a data virtuality logical data warehouse has as functionality inside the software. Yeah, so I hope um, I hope this uh, this could give a good overview. So since I was talking about the practitioner's uh, perspective already, um, so we already talked a bit earlier about the, the level of acquaintance with data virtualization as technology. Uh, talking from a practitioner's perspective, uh, another poll. Have you already implemented data virtualization in your company or are you planning uh, on doing so soon? So the poll is started and let's, let's have 30 seconds to answer. So we have the results of the poll now. Uh, so actually, it's nice to see that uh, already one third of one third of our audience is actually already using data virtualization tool. I would probably not be wrong saying that this is the same one third which also answered that they are familiar with data virtualization. And it's interesting that for I think almost almost fifty uh, percent, uh, a little below fifty percent of, of our audience. It's something that they're either looking into or planning uh, planning on implementing. So this is uh, very interesting information. So I think certainly the uh, uh, it's it is getting practical, uh, practical, practically relevant for many people. Uh, so Rick, I would um, I would uh, with this information I would pass on to you to see uh, what uh, what. Um, uh, what things, how can you summarize and how maybe you can elaborate on uh, how data virtualization helps with those uh, 10 challenges which you mentioned above. So, uh, uh, Rick, it's it's over to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let me go through these uh, 10 challenges. Uh, um, first one, uh, data is everywhere. As I said, data virtualization is all about abstraction, right? Data abstraction. It hides where and how data is stored and how it needs to be accessed. It can show all the data in an integrated fashion. So when data scientists access a data virtualization server, it feels to them as if all the required data is stored in one integrated system. Uh, data virtualization also hides where their data is stored on-prem or on cloud platforms or whether the data is coming from an internal or external source. So data is everywhere for the data scientists. If you use this data virtualization, data is just, it feels as if it's in one spot. Challenge number two, data virtualization can show all the data in an integrated fashion through one language, one interface. Uh, data virtualization supports query optimization techniques to efficiently execute distributed heterogeneous joins. And data stored in non-flat data sources can be flattened to make them more accessible for data science tools. So uh, data scientists won't see that they're accessing a heterogeneous set of source systems. Challenge number three, data stored in a schema on read form. Well, when data is stored in a structureless way, the structure can be defined within the views. And the definition of the view can, will contain all the logic that are required to turn that structureless data into structure-rich data. And don't forget that the data is still stored in its structureless form, right? But it's just viewed by data scientists as if it has structure. Challenge four, which deals with data hidden behind applications. Well, data virtualizations and servers can unlock the data hidden behind packaged applications. Uh, and views can also be defined on the interfaces, allowing the data to be accessed through the views. So data scientists do not have to deal with the complex uh, proprietary APIs of the applications. And as you can imagine, that, that saves them time. 
Challenge five, yeah, with data virtualization, you have views can be defined to transform cryptic into meaningful data. Uh, additionally, reference tables can be defined in the database server containing the cryptic values and their explanations, and these can, these can then be joined by the data virtualization engine, yeah, so joining the cryptic data coming from the source system. Uh, challenge number six, data history is missing. In case a source system does not keep track of history, the data scientist can transform a view into a replicated ta table. Uh, in the case of uh, data virtuality, logical data warehouse, uh, that particular product, uh, uh, that product can collect the history of data, which makes it an easy mechanism yeah, for data scientists to keep track of the history of data when they need it. If you want to know more about that feature, you should just ask uh, Nick. Uh, the next challenge rates, relates to poor data quality. Well, with, with views, yeah, uh, cleansing operations can be defined that carry out the data cleansing operations. Uh, and in fact, we can even define complex cleansing logic using the procedural SQL language. Uh, Challenge number eight, metadata is missing. Uh, well, in the data virtuality, a logical data warehouse product, the views and the columns can be documented and described and defined. And this metadata, although it may be missing in the source systems, can be added to the views. A data scientist can then access all that metadata. Uh, data virtualization also supports lineage features, allowing data scientists to see how the views are stacked on top of each other. Uh, so which one is uh, dependent on the other one. Uh, um, and, oh, by the way, data virtuality also unifies the metadata, right, from all the source systems. So, so you have one place for the data scientist to find all the data and the metadata. Challenge number six, yeah, dealing with data security rules. Uh, well, data virtualization, uh, Nick's product, yeah, offers highly detailed and extensive forms of data security, yeah, which views and columns data scientists are allowed to access can be specified yeah, for each of them uh, separately. Uh, and the advantage of this solution is that all the data security specs, yeah, who's allowed to see what, yeah, are centrally stored and managed. And then the last one, the one related to data privacy rules, well, when data scientists do have access to specific data, but they're not allowed to see the real data, again, it has to uh, pseudonymize, uh, well, we can define rules for that. Uh, uh, Nick, did I, did I miss something here? Uh, no, Rick. I think you are spot on. So you, uh, you, uh, I think you answered all the all the points. So um, sounds really easy. So it's just a matter of deploying data virtualization too, and then you are done with all the challenges. Uh, yeah, that's it, and you're done. Uh, no, I, th I, I no, I think uh, we should was. Yeah, uh, I think we need an architecture, right? A data architecture where, where data virtualization is the heart, right? Um, and from a data scientist perspective, we need a data architecture. Yeah, that that yeah, by some is now called the logical data architecture. And let me let me spend a minute on this one. Uh, so the logical data lake is a flexible data architecture that gives data scientists easier and quicker access to all the data. And again, at the heart, uh, you see that data virtualization engine. And this diagram presents this high level overview of that data architecture. Uh, and all the data here used by data scientists is managed by the data virtualization server. So for data scientists, the data virtualization server is their system for accessing data. Now, this ac architecture is therefore called the, the logical data lake or sometimes the, the virtual data lake. Um, and by the way, this naming yeah, is in line with the term logical data warehouse that has become very popular and is a flexible alternative to the more classic data warehouse architecture in which working with multiple copies of the data is very common. So the logical data lake, right? Um, so let, let me discuss what the main characteristics of the logical data lake are. Yeah. So first of all, yeah, data from multiple systems can be easily integrated, providing a central system in which all the data has been stored. So to data scientists, the logical data lake looks and feels like a central system in which all the data has been stored together. Data scientists can use one and the same language or interface to access all the data yeah, instead of having to learn and work with different languages for different source systems. Uh, different data scientists can access data on different levels of processing. They can use the top level views or the bottom level views, or they can use, let's say, uh, process data or very raw data. 
data processing operations that need to be applied to the data are defined in views and can be reused and shared. For example, if a data scientist has developed a structure-rich view on top of a structure-less file, this view can be reused by all his or her colleagues, so they don't have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. And all the rules for data security and privacy are defined on the views inside the data virtualization server, and they're defined only once. The data virtualization server may need to access may need access to a system containing master data. Well, master data may be a requirement to determine what the correct data is or to combine the data from different source systems. Again, for data scientists, the master data will look like a set of views that is as easily to access as the source data. And data scientists can use metadata to determine the meaning of certain data elements and data values. And finally, you know, data lineage functionalities enable data scientists to see a complete audit trail to trace back the data flow all the way yeah, to the data the, to the to the source system. So, all right, I hope this summarizes it quite, did, did this well, and I hope it gives you an idea of what a logical data lake uh, looks like. Uh, by the way, Nick, you, you told me that you already have customers who built their data lake using your logical data warehouse product in order to support to support data science. What do you see there? Are there elements of the logical data world's product that can bring something extra? Yeah, so the feedback um, the feedback we have from data scientists is uh, that one thing which kind of makes their life easier from the uh, from the um, from the practical perspective is that that can get data uh, in a uniform way from a central source and that they also have the possibility to search for the data. So basically it eases up their, their, their data acquisition, uh, their data acquisition part of their work. Um, one thing which is, uh, which is maybe a bit more um, uh, like a, a larger perspective, looking from a larger perspective is that we have experience when uh, the data models with cases, use cases where the data models built by data scientists become actually a part of this internal uh, data treasure and they actually they are being served uh, via logical data warehouse to different use cases for example we have a use case where uh, data models built built by data scientists uh, serve the like uh, for example credit uh, credit risk score um, uh, modeling and this credit risk score is served via logical data warehouse to the uh, to different consumers uh, in the company also outside to basically to combine the data but also the data models from data scientists and deliver them through logical data warehouse for further usage so these are some extra things but i think i can go go i can go for for hours uh, on extra things so i would uh, pass uh, pass back to you eric to summarize today's webinar so what do you think uh, should be the key takeaways for our listeners all right, let's let's do that. Uh, uh, well, you you began by saying that data science is a profession with a long history. Uh, and throughout its history, it has faced a wide variety of changes, right? Such as new algorithms, new tools, new use cases, and the availability availability of much more data. In, in fact, data science has never been a static discipline. Uh, and the latest changes and challenges that data scientists face are a fast changing data storage technology landscape, a new restrictive re regulation for data privacy and time and the time consuming data preparation phase uh, so organizations I would say need data architectures that enable data scientists to develop analytical models in the easiest and the fastest way possible uh, and these data architectures should help data scientists to cope uh, with the set all the challenges that we discussed and a popular solution that helps data scientists to deal with these challenges is to copy the data they need yeah, to a centralized environment on a cloud platforms. Others have opted for a data lake. Now, I think both solutions have strong but also weak points. For example, both handle the first group of challenges we discussed, but the other ones are not adequately dealt with. Uh, a third solution is to implement a logical data lake architecture in which data virtualization is applied. And such an architecture meets or can meet all the 10 challenges yeah, we discussed during this webinar. It offers data scientists easy and fast access to data. And for data scientists, such an architecture simplifies data access and consequently shortens the data preparation phase, allowing them to spend more time on analytics. And I would say that's important, that they can spend more time on analytics. All right, back to you, Nick.
Yeah, thank you very much for a great uh, for a great uh, uh, summary, Rick. Um, I think we don't have much time, but uh, Sue, maybe we can uh, we can do a couple of questions. Sue, can you help? Sure. Thank you very much, Rick and Nick, for the interesting discussion. Um, let's take a look at the questions from our audience. Um, since we are running out of time, I'll take just one question and the rest we will um, take care by email. So Rick, um, there's one question asking, does working with data visualization mean that the data scientists have to become super SQL specialists? Is oh, that true? Right. Yeah, um, it, 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 the answer is it depends. So um, uh, what, what we could do is ask the data engineers, right, to build all the views for them. Uh, and then they only need uh, SQL or a little bit knowledge of SQL uh, to get the data via the data virtualization server yeah, to their uh, analytical tools, their data science tools. Uh, of course, uh, if they are knowledgeable, if they do understand SQL, then maybe they can build some of the views themselves. Uh, but I think that the most important thing is that if we make all the data accessible yeah, through data virtualization, they can use almost any kind of data science tool yeah, that they that they would like to play with to access the data. But the point is they don't have to deal with all the nitty gritty technical database stuff yeah, to, to create their models. They could just focus on what they are paid for and it is to create models. So no, they don't have to become a super SQL specialist, but if they if they want to, uh, they can use SQL inside the data virtualization engine. Great, that sounds good. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for your time and interest today. Um, as I said, all the questions that weren't able to be covered today will be answered via email. Um, thank you and have a lovely day or evening from wherever you called in. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.